um, a concern that I had. Um, I think 2011 was the first um, case that I came across where um, uh, a young woman, so she did define as um, cis female, um, had uh, been given a prison sentence in the UK for gender fraud, what would become known informally as gender fraud. Um, and I was very concerned at how the case was reported, and there was a very trashy documentary made subsequently about it. And I had England at the time because attitudes towards um, gender variance and sexuality were very, felt very much in flux that this wouldn't be the only case. And sadly, I was right. So the following year, there was another case. Uh, the following year, there was another case, this time involving um, a young trans man. Um, and by that stage, I felt like I really wanted to find a way to compassionately and humanely explore the issues because I felt like um, for many urgent reasons, um, these cases were hitting on the fault lines of big cultural shifts and discussions that weren't being had um, in with the degree of um, sensitivity and intelligence that I felt like they deserved. So I started drafting something um uh and at first i thought it might be a, i thought it actually might be a tv idea but one or two meetings with companies and that was very clearly not the direction because it really wasn't we still i mean we've come on such a long way in the last 10 years it's worth remembering that so the conversations were very crass actually so i took it back and i sat down one day and the monologue essentially came out in one go um and at that stage, it felt very personal. So uh, I'm a gender and I didn't always have the language for that. And that was a journey that I was on as well, probably in the last uh, five to 10 years. Um, and so I knew that I wanted to premiere it at a queer festival. I knew I wanted to work with um, the right sensibility. And it felt like for its first exploration, I was very keen to take the piece out myself, to take that responsibility on. And there's no faster way <laughs> to temperature gauge a piece of work than to be in it yourself and feel that live experience in a room, in the room that you were in. And I always say about that, ex that particular experience, it felt very, it really felt palpable for such, even in the early stages that you saw it. I knew that I was hitting on things and in, and and even while I was performing it, I performed it twice at that festival as a scratch. Um, there was, you know, 70 percent of me was working and performing and 10 percent of me was just like a rabbit in the headlights and afraid. <laughs> and then the other the rest of me was editing because again, there's nothing like that live conversation that you have, that contract you have with people in a room. What feels safe? What feels um hot what feels challenging um so once i'd done that work and redrafted the piece uh and i think the piece as well if when you read it um in terms of the stage directions and and just just the way the monologue is written it is it, it's sort of semi-directed from the inside so uh, another reason why i was very happy to hand over to prime cut was i think the piece very much knew itself and knew what it wanted to be and i'd set that template up so handing over then the, the the audition process was actually very challenging and amy came in unexpectedly sort of towards the end of the process and again it wasn't just a performance thing it was a it was a soulful thing it was a spiritual thing like she really understood what the piece was um and has always been a great champion of the piece and i do think that a lot of the piece's success initially was to do with that energy um and of course, as you probably know, subsequently, the piece has gone on as it was intended to be performed by trans performers, non-binary performers, cis, you know, it's one of the, I hope one of the joys of the piece is that it is able to hold different experiences and stories. Um, but yeah, I don't remember the moment when I took, when I made the decision that I wouldn't perform it, but um, I feel very comfortable with that. <laughs> I, I, I think I had the meatiest experience at the beginning. I taught this text at the Ulster University and you're correct in that um, there's a very strong identification for people of all sorts of genders and sexualities 
in relation to the piece. Um, I want to ask a question. I've got two questions here, and then I think we should bring the, the students in. The first one relates to um, the, the term gender fraud, and I think that really gets us into the material of the play. When I first heard the term, I thought it sort of might relate to people behaving according to the gender assigned on their birth certificate. So that it might relate to people who didn't identify as, for example, male, um, but who were designated male. So that it's actually the reverse of what the law was calling gender fraud. Um, I ha have a, a, a sort of, I'd like, to, I'd like to find out more about where you, what the ideas were around fraud and which gender fraud and which, which um, which uh, thinkers or academic writers um, were an influence on the piece. I know that you uh, were in touch with, obviously with Outburst, um, with um, uh, support organizations and uh, advocates for trans rights in the course of the writings. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about that and how those ideas came into the, the play? Uh, so I think, I think you're right. And, and you know, blissfully, I think the phrase and the idea of gender fraud has since ebbed away from public discourse happily. And at the time, it was a very contested. Um, and as I say, it was always used with scare quotes. It never seemed to quite make its way into official parlance, but it was being used in the press in a sensational way. Um, and a lot like in the early days, people thought people got didn't uh, didn't have a grasp on the language around transgender, trans male, AFAB, you know, that was all felt like it was sort of, um, we were educating each other and some people were more willing <laughs> to be educated than others. Um, it felt, so So when I started the journey, I was, um, I was cognizant of the fact that there are a number of experiences that converge here, some of which some of which are very close to mine and some of which aren't and so obviously the, the the best and most conscientious way to approach that is to make sure that all those voices are heard so it was really paramount as soon as i came to outburst with the piece that we would try to um canvas those different experiences and, and again luckily at the time there was a fairly new um, self-organized group for trans masculine people in Belfast um, and we got in touch with those guys very quickly. I have known Fox Fisher as well um, who has done in, an incredible amount of work from in his Brighton, a Brighton based artist and filmmaker um, and so I was in touch with Fox. Uh, I, was, I was in touch with a number of people that I, artists um, and activists that I found um, inspiring and uh, enlightening. Uh, some of whom came to then feature in the little um, preface to the to the piece, which again I felt when it came around to publishing, I had questions about what it meant to put a piece like this out into the world, especially when I really wanted the the cases and the traumas around it to to expire. <laughs> um, but if we were going to do that, to use the platform to at least um, give voice to some other to, to some other activists and experience um so and also q and a's became incredibly important post-show discussions um for the prime cut tour were as often as we could built in to the to the show um and one of the things that was very validating and moving about this piece was how um how ready it was to open those discussions in places that you wouldn't expect. So, you know, some of the most incredible Q&As we had were in like rural Ireland, you know, or we would have young people who would come back two or three times and then eventually with family and maybe they were on a journey themselves. Um, so it, it felt as again was always intended that it wasn't just the piece itself, but sort of the secondary experience around the piece that um, might be of value in the world. So again, I can't say it enough, but on those panels, we always tried to make sure we had a um, a, a range of voices and experiences. Um, again, cis, trans, uh, you know, people 
Well, again, when we, even when we were in rural areas, the rural and the urban experience of gender and sexuality is different again. So, you know, just sort of being cognizant of those of those different voices um, was, yeah, was always built into the ambition of the piece. Yeah, great. Um, I, I hope there are the questions that some of the students have. I think you probably touched on some of those things. That's great. Um, uh, I, I have one other area that I, I sort of want to look at a little bit and then we'll move swiftly along, but in a way, in, in the way that override it appears to be about uh, tech and body enhancement that is actually about relationships, I think it's fair to say that Scorch appears to be about transgender politics, but is actually about relationships too in some way. Um, you made a comment. This is the moment where the, where the interviewee gets very nervous. You, you said in, the, in, a, in a, a comment in The Guardian from uh, September 19, 2016, I'm interested in responses to the play. It's interpretation as a trans piece because that seems to ignore aspects of lesbian sexuality. It's as if butch lesbians have gone away. They haven't. And now we can um, only talk about this in terms of a uh, medicated idea of transition from one gender to another. Do you think then that that, um, that your intention is, is, wide, is wider? Is that what's implied by the comment, that you really want the, the reverberations of the piece to be more than just about trans issues? Completely. And I mean, that's a, that's a, it's, it's amazing to me and yet not that that's the, mo that's the, um, the quotation to be pulled out because I had a lot of pain and trouble with that, um, article. Um, and I felt like it's slightly, I, and I don't think intentionally, but it's slightly misrepresented the conversation that was had. Um, so it just seems like a small thing, but I can't remember exactly the wording, but it, what I said was that it's interesting to me when it's when the piece is um, uh, when it's seen as solely a trans piece, by which I meant the idea was always that it would speak to multiple experiences. Um, and then the comment that followed about butch lesbians, again, it, it, the idea was not that those things were in some way mutually exclusive, but that all of those experiences are valuable and, and important and the visibility of those things. Um, and yes, this idea that in the press, it felt like there was only discourse around medical idea, medicalized, medical, sorry, medicalized ideas of transition, where of course we now are much better at talking about and understanding the fact that there are many, many gray areas. Um, and that the idea of a sort of gender binary between trans men, trans women being a certain thing and only that thing is yet another binary that we really should resist. Um, and again, the, even the idea of non-binary identity has really been become much more normalized even since that article was published. So um, it's, it's slightly painful to me in a funny way that that article is out there. And yet I'm glad that you brought it up because we still can we can get under those things now with much greater nuance but yes of course it, the the piece itself was always geared towards i think i've made it clear you know i'm a great advocate for nuance and for um intelligent discussion and quite often these things get so radically reduced so quickly into sound bites and um you know s political sticks to beat each other with um and surely, if there's one place that we can do better than that, it's it's art. Yeah, I'm sorry for pulling that up. I, I, I actually thought it was a really good quote. I thought it was really strong. Um, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to leave the the, um, the, the my question set there. Um, and, but I'll sign off with a quote which I which is not from Stacey Gray. It's a bit obvious. It's from Judith Butler. Um, who is, I think, probably a, a, a philosophy you should read in consideration of, of the play Scorch. Um, and it, 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 it kind of aligns with your stated intention for the play, which is that it's not about binaries, it's not about either or. Um, if there are 8 billion people, there are 8 billion sexualities, really. And there are 8 billion versions of gender identity. Uh, Butler says, there is no gender identity behind the expressions of gender. That identity 
is performatively constituted by the very expressions that are said to be its results. That's from Gender Trouble, 1990. So I think we've got a really good idea of what Scorch is about, and it's, it's a fantastic piece of work because it sits, as Stacey says, on the fault line of really important issues that are in discussion in society. Um, and, and it's provoked some very interesting questions. So I'm going to invite uh, some of the students up to ask questions. We've got some good questions for you. Um, I'm going to see, in no particular order, um, if we could have Carlota, Car Carlota Rodenos Caballero. Carlota, are you here? Carlota Rodenas. Donde estas, Carlota? Mom, which is the group? To which group does Carlota belong? You're hiding. <laughs> if, if need be, I can ask for a lot of yeah, questions. Okay, well, we can speak. Uh, can we have a representative of Pretty Little Liars? Do we have them? Great. So, there's a good question about the title of the play and the ideas. Come on up, ask a question. Yeah. And then, yeah, if we have Louis, Lucia, if you want, standing by down the front. So, if, if you could just grab a seat at the front, we're going to have, if you jump up here, you see the line here, can you stand up? So, ask me to see your question. <laughs> Um, why is it called Scorch? <laughs> Thank you. Um, it came from the, I mean, I think that Kez talks a little bit about it towards the end of the monologue. It's this sense of being burned by something beautiful, by feeling like you've almost become or almost touched something that feels right and pure and essential and yet it can do so much feel like be weaponized or do so much damage and it felt at the end of the monologue like Kezi was emerging from having been scorched um, and I think that Kez burns so brightly through the piece and I really wanted the experience of what it feels like to be a young person to be a you know an adolescent to be having these experiences and these feelings for the first time and you can, you know, you you can incinerate yourself with your own heat and light, um, and so that was where Scorch came from. It's both beautiful, but also potentially brutal. Good question. Um, she had a really good question about um, staging and positioning on oh, stage. Do you remember that question? Well, I don't remember it. Uh, well, I don't remember it uh, like word by word, but I do remember it being somewhat uh, in the terms of uh, were you concerned about this like new positioning of everyone? Because like the uh, the the actor or actress actor is supposed to be in the center and the audience in the circle around them, just like therapy, <laughs> and as. <laughs> As a deeply hurt person in life, I was wondering if you were uh, just concerned of how that approach would, like, would turn out. Or uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, I I hear you, and some performers find it very difficult to work in the round. And luckily, I had performed a two-hander in the round in 2013. Um, and I find it a very charged, visceral, intimate experience. You know, we were in tiny spaces. One night, a girl fainted, and we, we had her. She was with a school group, and the teacher was like, "Oh no, carry on, carry on with the play." She always does this, you know. And we, <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. Um, and I felt like that immediacy, and you know, I. I'm hesitant to use the word claustrophobia, but yes, of course, there is a sense of being 
um, entrapped. But I, but, but that's all the more reason why I wanted Kessie to be full of love and to feel like there was a real communion um, and a community in that. So I think, uh, and the the prime cut production was kind of like a bull ring. It was it was a uh, in the round but raised up, um, and there became something very magical about how it felt like a therapy group. But then it also felt like the judge and jury. And it also felt like, the, you know, the press pit. Um, and so all of those things feel very strong, but it, but we always made sure to make to, to look after the performer and also to sort of um, never make an audience feel threatened. It was about inviting them in. So I talk as well in the stage directions about keeping the house lights up a little bit because I didn't want that plunged into darkness feeling. I wanted everyone to feel like they could see each other and we were there together. There's no there's no secrets here, you know. Um, but also you you can quite often in your stage direction, Stacey, be, you can be quite um, generous to the production. You're always like, your stage directions always say, well, you can't do this if you like, or maybe you might do this. Why so? Um, one of the things that I always say that I always talk about with my work is that I want it to be an invitation. So um, whilst I think I'm quite clear about what the, what the gesture of the piece will be and what I might want as an artist, ultimately I believe in that artistic creativity and reflection. So I love an invitation. Maybe this happens. Maybe it doesn't, you know, like it's, it, you know, the it, it, it's, it's your ultimately the, the art is out of my control. I'm not like, I always make jokes about the Beckett estate because <laughs> there's so much that you can't do. And I just like, it's so antithetical to the way that, um, that I want to put work into the world. I'll pass that on to Joanna Marston, my agent, who is also Samuel Beckett's agent. <laughs> okay, <laughs> um, Alexandra, Alexandra sans Pina. Are you here? Come, ask a question. Alexandre, 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 sorry, I was giving you a French pronunciation with the scope of it. Alexandre has um, in questions about your inspirations and your expectations. Uh, so, what were your, your expectations when you published your first work? Uh, I am not sure how to answer that because I think I was so in shock that my work was published at all. And it's actually kind of terrifying because especially when work is published, once it's out there, you can't take it back. It's out in the world. Um, and I think sometimes increasingly that's just, that can be a source of anxiety. Um, having said that, there's nothing more validating as a new playwright than to get a publishing deal. Um, and so I felt incredibly humble about that. And the first piece I had published was Perv. Um, and that was a great start to, to a career for me. Um, yeah, a question about inspiration. Yeah, and the other question I have is what were your what are your inspirations for your work? Uh, I think that I am widely influenced by um, visual culture generally. So I love cinema. I love um, I'm I, my taste in theater leans into live art. So um, I like unconventional work, work that breaks the fourth wall. Um, there are a lot of uh, British and Irish companies who do work that way. M some of my earliest experiences were at the Theatre Treffen in Berlin. Um, so I wouldn't, I can't think of, like it's less playwrights perhaps than, than processes of working, but Obviously, early playwrights I loved were Sarah Kane or um, Berkov uh, uh, and, you know, some of the contemporary playwrights to come out of the royal court. But basically people who are who play with form um, and who aren't afraid of ideas would be my favourite, my favourite uh, work. Yeah. 
you have a question? Very similar to this question. Yeah, we've, we've had two or three people, including, I should mention, Mark Espinoza, yeah, about, uh, about uh, this particular point. So you can come up too, actually, why not? Yeah. Um, you seem to turn out a lot of plays. You're a very prolific playwright, so I guess you're, you're very turned on to the scene. And my question is similar, you know, do you go backwards to get inspiration or do you just keep forging forward? And obviously what you just said about Kess, you also get inspiration just from the goings on of every day and what's in the news. Is that true? And how do you incorporate something like that into a monologue about a, a teenager awakening sexually? Great question. Um, I don't tend to look back a lot. Um, and I, I think related to that is the fact that I really embrace what some people might consider failure. And it took a long time to get to that point. So no, for me, no work is lost. And every experience is an educative one. Um, so I think that I think that I've in that sense, I've always moved forward. Um, and although I have preoccupations, I am more likely to get deeply into new ideas. So um, one of the things I talk about a lot is dreams. So I might be thinking about something for years. Um, that's certainly been the case. Shibboleth was a very good example of that, where I didn't know, I didn't know how to write the play and I failed many times. I tried, class is another thing. I'm from a working class background and people in the UK particularly are very bad at talking about socioeconomic class. And for years I tried and failed to write those pieces um, and then suddenly I'll find a way. I wrote a piece called Hatchet Ginny, which also went on at the Outburst Queer Festival. And it was about my granny. And I thought it was about my granny, but it wasn't. It was about class. It was about gender. It was about sexuality. It was about being Northern Irish. But one day I woke up and I knew that that's what it was. And it's delicate and it's small and it has a heart. But it also speaks to all of these big ideas. For me, if I try to write something, if I sit down and try to write about the big issues, I, the work usually is not good. So there's a certain amount of patience and waiting for those small, beautiful things to come along. And that's the play. <laughs> that makes me optimistic. Thank you. And so this is Mark. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> okay, so dealing with intertextuality, do you think that there is any author that has influenced or inspired you on your way of writing? Could you give us an example, please? Uh, of an author or a playwright? Author. Oh, <laughs> I, I ask that only because there are obviously authors that have influenced and inspired me as well and filmmakers. I always, uh, you know, I always say that the influences are very wide. Um, but it, it, that's what I was. <laughs> it's a tricky one. Um, you know, Carol Churchill. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Carol Churchill's work, I think. One of the biggest compliments anyone ever paid me about Override was that it felt like it might be in the Churchill <laughs> canon. <laughs> um, uh, oh gosh, always my brain goes blank when people ask me this. Um, I love Emma Crowe's work. Um, uh, the, the groups that I talked about earlier, like Gob Squad, the kind of punk collectives that make work um, that perhaps don't have one prominent playwright. Um, and very early on, I, even though it's not fashionable to say it now, I was quite influenced by Pinter. Pinter was one of the first playwrights that I really enjoyed and got into at university. Um, but it changes, I would say. It changes. Like I said, I, I, I like anything that feels a bit rule bust and a bit radical. Um, and, and playwrights who don't take themselves seriously as playwrights. My least favourite playwright is a playwright who wants to tell everybody what they think. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Stacey. Gob Squad, if they come to Valencia, go. Gob Squad are amazing. Kitchen, 
changed my life. It was one of the most exciting things I've ever seen. Okay, do we have Aroa Lopez? And can we just make sure to keep the background noise levels low because of the audio, if the, the, the mic picks these things up. So Aroa has great questions about how your themes work in the social uh, context of the UK society. Okay, so my question is, how are the themes treated on the play reflected in the UK society? Do you consider it an advanced society on these issues compared to other Western countries? So is this Scorch specifically? Sorry, I didn't hear. It is Scorch? Okay. Um, uh, how are the themes reflected in UK society? It, sorry, it, was that the first half of the question? Um, yeah. I, I think, yeah, I think, like I sort of hinted at earlier, on one hand, since the play was published, we were in the throes of a lot of discourse around consent, around the hashtag Me Too movement, and around um, trans rights and the emergence of non-binary um, identities uh, in around sort of 2015, 2016. I'm not sure how much you know you would be aware of it, but there, the UK press do seem to have a great transphobic problem compared to, for example, the American press. Um, so, and, and also in terms of Irish feminism, and that's probably for a, com a whole other conversation another time. But I think that the themes in the play, sadly, are still playing out in what are called the culture wars at present. Um, and there's a real vying between different ideas of feminism in particular um, that, that isn't that isn't very dignified or attractive at times. Um, so where in, where in some instances, I, I think the themes of the play um, feel almost bedded in and comfortable now, especially with the younger generations coming up. I think that they're the, the themes of the play in terms of um, uh, public dissonance and in terms of a clash of meta narratives and in terms of deep seated fears that are rooted in uh, mis boring old misogyny, homophobia, transphobia. I think all of those things are absolutely still at large with us, even if they are better at hiding. Um, and again, I think the play in its very quiet way tries to use human experience, but also the experience of very young and vulnerable people to sort of throw cold water on some of those discussions and bring people back to their senses. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. I'd like to ask Aroa a question. Do you think the UK is an advanced society on these issues compared to maybe Spain? Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> what do you think? Do you think, you think Spain is good? Uh, <laughs> there is a lot of things that we, the country has to improve that. Yes. Okay, thank you. And we have Ma. Uh, <laughs> Did you expect of the play and 
how did you manage to get <coughs> sorry into the characters and um, psychology um, I was possibly more afraid of the reception to this piece than any other piece I'd written because I knew that I was touching on hot topics and I was very worried about it being misinterpreted or misused um, and I'm very happy to say that that really didn't happen there there was perhaps one or two what I would describe as insensitive um, albeit positive reviews of the of the piece but by and large the reception was incredibly warm and ready um, and of you know of course there will always be question and voices and I expected that I think that the piece will date I think that young people coming to it now may not even within five or six years realize how far we've come um, in terms of getting into the psychology of the character like I hinted at earlier I drew a lot on my own experience I read a lot a lot about these cases and there was quite a lot to get I got court papers um, I went through archives and records and I spoke to um, legal experts so on one hand I did my research and that was objective and like that was experience that is not mine but in terms of creating Kesey and a young person who has questions and is very naive uh, a lot of that was quite accessible to me as someone who grew up in a very homophobic um, quite misogynist working class background um, where these sort of experiences and questions weren't really welcome uh, so I think that I put you know I put all of that together really in the work Thank you. So this is the last question from the floor, and then we've got a couple from the podium. Um, I don't know if I'm saying their name right, but I was talking to a friend the other day, and they told me about the case a few years ago of Keira Bell. And do you think that will influence theater on LGBT topics or has it influenced it um, already? Tell us the name of the case again. Gaida uh, Bell, I think it is, isn't it? Right. That is one of Gail. Gail, was that? Yes. So Gail, Gail was a much more recent case um, that was post the production. So there was Gemma Barker. Uh, Justin McNally were the big ones. Uh, there, as I say, there were um, at least two cases around trans men. And then um, Gail's case came about 2016. So I think that case was running concurrently when Scorch was out at Edinburgh. Um, and that was quite fascinating because Gail got the harshest sentence. She got something like eight years. Um, by that stage for what it's worth the press were dealing with it generally in a more sensitive way so i noticed that some of the press everything okay <laughs> yeah good cool um i noticed that some of the press went back and edited their original um reports because the language was so poor um, so Gail's case sadly was just another one uh, in the in the pattern that we were seeing but ha again happily it hasn't happened since that I know of I think Gail's was the last high profile case uh, Ivan has uh, mentioned uh, or is pointing to Kira Bell do you know by Kira Bell Kira with a K Kira Bell um, <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. Sadly, there's probably a, a lot of, the, of these that we don't really know about. Um, I'm going to move on. So this conversation will probably go. Okay, so a couple of questions from some uh, practitioners in the... Um, in the 
and the theater world in Valencia. Um, does the protagonist, does Kes get to impersonate the different characters, change voice and so on? Or does Kes always draw them from her own character? Can, I suppose what the, the question is, does Kes jump out of character and become a different character? Or does, is it reported for form? I think instinctively they, they would be um, impersonations of those characters that originate from Kesey. So <laughs> one of the things that um, I like in terms of a texture of performance is that we see the performer at all times. We see the machinations of theatre. It's another reason why I like theatre in the round or minimal props is because we're not trying to hoodwink an audience here. There's a, um, there's a certain transparency as, as far as there can be in the world of performance and theatre. Um, but my my instinct would certainly be that those characters are coming from um, Kez rather than uh, that you try to direct it in any way as a discrete um, performance. And um, so how long has it been performed and where? Is it still going around? Is there, are there still performances happening? Can you give us an indication of? of there's there's a reading going to happen in New York in a couple of weeks um, and there was a school performance quite recently uh, and there was a performance. I, I get quite a lot of requests by drama students, which is which is gorgeous um, and I always grant them and also where possible. It's it sounds very grand saying this, but I like to like waive, you know, agents fees and stuff because again, the piece, the piece feels sort of um, like it wasn't made, you know, it's not, it wasn't made to make money, do you know what I mean? So um, uh, there's been, there's been quite a lot of amateur productions, for example, there was um, a very successful production in Canada um, that ran with a non-binary performer. Um, there was a Portuguese translation in Brazil that was a very, um, uh, it was its own interpretation as in like it took Scorch almost as a starting point. Um, and it happened during the pandemic, so they made it quite a sort of digital visual piece. And again, I was very happy for them to do that. Uh, and there's been there was a performance in a Mexican women's prison. Um, there have been performances with multiple cast rather than one performer. So uh, so, uh, yeah, it, it's traveled pretty widely and it's also been treated pretty widely, which again, you know, I'm I'm very excited about. Staging. Sorry, Don, I didn't catch it again. Do have these uh, other performances always retained in the end of Ryan staging? I think all of them, apart from the digital one, where it was um, face to camera. Just the last question on on this, um, and then we're going to introduce Maria with some with some questions. Um, uh, do you are you aware of, of the um, the impact of giving visibility to these issues, and has there been a sort of social impact from the play itself, uh, even up to and including um, sort of judicial considerations? Do you believe it's had any impacts in these in these kind of bigger uh, frames of discussion? Um, I, I I would I would be nervous to flatter myself. Um, having said that, I do know that the piece has been embraced educationally in, in centres of education. I do know that a lot of people um, involved in the judiciary or working with young people came to see the piece, that it had a lot of press coverage. Um, and on a personal level, I, kn I know for a fact, because I've had people contact me and stay in touch, that it was quite instrumental in a number of young people's journeys. And usually that was either as a as a place that a safe place that they felt they could bring family because, you know, the piece. You know, the, even the fact that it was embraced in Northern Ireland, you know, which is, as we know, traditionally pretty conservative. Um, I don't know, it, it sort of gave a I, I don't know if the phrase is right, but it just felt like a safe space for some people, I think. Um, and and artistically, then also, I know quite a few young people who came to see it and hadn't really had any interest in the arts, came because of what the piece was about 
and have since and subsequently started making their own work, which again is, you know, incredible. Yeah, it's really incredible, actually, as you said, that this piece came from a Northern Irish writer. I just want to ask anybody in the audience, can you guess when LGBTQ plus people got legal equality in Northern Ireland, full legal equality? Tell me a date, show me a hand. 2015. Have they got it? Anybody else? <laughs> December 2020. Yeah, somebody got that right. We got it right. Well done. Okay. December 2020. Finally, equality. Okay. Thank you, Stacey. I'm going to step out. I'm going to ask Maria to ask you. She has some questions that are more generally about your work. Um, you should also read Ferv. You should read Override, Lagan, and Shibboleth. Um, Many of the same themes are in those plays, and uh, there are lots of, of overlap. Um, Maria, I'll give you this <laughs> and this. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Hello. Uh, <laughs> good evening again. Uh, I just wanted to uh, make a. Uh, I was thinking. I was making a reflection about these uh, plays. Court. This is something that when I was teaching the play in the first term with them, um, they were so shocked, so surprised, because this thing about gender fraud, we don't have anything like that in Spain. So that's what we decided. That it, it, it was really shocking. We couldn't believe it. So my question is, do you think this play could travel to Spain? Do you think it would, um, I don't know, would it be a good idea to translate it? Or perhaps the message will be lost precisely because we don't know what gender fraud is, or we, we've never had something like that in the law. I mean, we have a lot of homophobia as well, but not really this uh, legal term. Thank you. I think it's an interesting question. My, my first response would be that it has traveled to countries that haven't experienced gender fraud the way the UK has. Having said that, as you say, most places have experienced homophobia, transphobia, misogyny, and so on. So where the idea of gender fraud um, met legalities in the UK, is, is, it's a bit like what Don said, it's slightly besides the point. Um, it's a technicality. Um, the ideas in the play and the clash of um, disclosure, uh, consent, gender variance, those are themes and experiences and current issues that translate very easily to m most young people in the world. Thank you very much. Um, okay. <laughs> My other questions have uh, nothing to do with Scorch, really. <laughs> they have to do with another play, Shibboleth. Um, uh, I don't know if I got it right. You said that um, you wrote it in 2010. Um, I read somewhere that there was a performance or at least an oral reading at the Peacock in 2009. Is that possible? Yeah, and, I mean, I was just going to, yeah, I was writing it and developing it. Um, so, yes, we could very easily have done a reading in 2009. But initially, it was passed on and not produced, and then and then there was a new, there was a fresh decision made in 2015, and that's when we had the full production. Okay, and <laughs> so the first production was really at the Abbey Theatre in 2015. Yeah. That's correct. In revived. Uh, it wasn't, it was an initial, it, uh, well, revived in as much as it was a play that was taken out of the drawer, but it was, <laughs> it was its first production. Sorry, I didn't hear that. Uh, has it been revived? Or you, you said it hasn't, sorry. Oh, so has it been revived since 2015? Ah, no, no, it hasn't. Um, I'm just thinking and checking. Nope, it hasn't. That's it. What a shame. 
<laughs> I love the place. I know. We, we, we desperately wanted it to go to Belfast, obviously, to London. Um, and it has been discussed academically. It has been, you know, widely uh, read. But yeah, um, for, for various reasons, uh, it has not had a revival. Uh, my students, I showed them the video that you recorded uh, when, for the, the Guardian, I think it was, about these videos about the Brexit and the one that the actor was walking around the walls and I was telling them, look at the walls, because that was the main topic of another play, she went that, that's a beautiful video by the way. And another question in relation to that is uh, talking about uh, the academic research. I don't know if you've read, do you read the articles that appear about your case? That's just out of curiosity. <laughs> uh, no, no, I mean, not unless they're sent to me. I don't tend to go looking for them. I know there are some out there, <laughs> but um, yeah, so I, I may have come across Okay, because my I said, oh, okay. My question is about one article that appeared last year. Nakasi, Justine Nakasi's opinion of the wall in Chivale that she believes that the performance at the army was wrong because the wall was impersonated by a woman and that was exactly the opposite of the idea of the wall. Do you agree with her? I mean I don't know if you've read it, but do you agree with this idea or do you think it was a good have choice? To I haven't read it. I find it fascinating that someone thinks that it was wrong, you know, that, that there is a right and a wrong way. I think that everyone is welcome to their interpretation. And of course, I can see that the voice of the wall, the voice of oppression, the voice of war, the voice of imperialism, the voice of nationalism could and would often, most often, be interpreted as male. But in performance, there was something so seductive about Cara, the wonderful blues musician who played that part. Um, and she was slightly uh, detached from the physical reality of the wall that ultimately had this mouth that consumed the character Mo. Um, so for the interaction, the sort of yearning for a maternal energy from some of the young men in that piece and for many many other reasons i really enjoyed the the the, the casting of a female wall i would argue that you know any casting of that will will present something different and that's interesting to me but i would refute probably that there's a right or a wrong answer to that Okay, the moment has arrived. Tell us about your new film. Um, goodness, it's a, it feels like a pivot, doesn't it? Um, yeah, I found myself uh, interested, increasingly interested in cinema. And uh, in 20, 2019, very suddenly and quickly, the finance came together um, for me to direct my first feature film. Um, the screenplay that I, which I had written, um, and the screenplay had been around for a while, and I, we had been trying to attach a director to it, um, and then this suddenly it, it became apparent that perhaps I should direct it. Um, so we shot that in the end of 2019, and then there was the pandemic. Um, so post on the film editing uh, took a lot longer, and it was released uh, this year. Uh, and it's available at the moment to stream on Amazon, Apple, <laughs> Sky, various platforms. Um, but that was, you know, that's a new a new foray for me. Um, and it premiered at South by um, one best film at Galway Film Fla, uh, and has had a rather lovely life. And uh, I'm 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 still adjusting to the idea of now being considered a filmmaker. Um, and how to, you know, how to keep all those plates spinning. I, I feel like Graham Norton here. Uh, you're supposed to tell us the name and, and for what, what, where we can stream it. <laughs> the film is called Here Before, 
um and uh, it, like i say i think it, i think it's on google play i think it's on um amazon apple tv uh curzon i don't know whether you've got access to that bt roku so it should be available um go and find it see what you think so i think that deserves a round of applause Um, and I, I've got to run. I have got to be at the airport in about 15 minutes. So, um, so I'd just like to say thank you, Stacey. Thank you. Uh, thank you to uh, the Department de Filología Inglesa in the Universitat de Valencia. And um, yeah. Uh, I'll see you back in Canada. Maybe for a coffee. Indeed, we'll have a coffee. Thank you very much for <coughs> for, the, for for having me, and also for all the very interesting questions. I feel like I've had a workout, and it's nice. So, thank you. Cheers, Stacey. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.